I'll show you the map. I gotta get more stuff. Good morning, everyone. We welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as we gather for worship this morning. Glad to see everyone here. Oh, it is a joy when we're able to gather and worship our triune God. Uh, not a whole lot in the way of announcements. Uh, this uh, Thursday is Men's Grill Night. Oh, it is an exciting time when the men of the church get to gather together by the uh, fire pit and light it up and just spend some time uh, enjoying fellowship and uh, uh, praying for one another and encouraging one another. We invite all the guys to come. That will be at 6.30. 6.30 until however long you can stand it. That's how that works. By the way, this, uh, this time around, it's going to be BYOB, Bring Your Own Boy. Uh, we're allowing the uh, young people to come. Um, I think we were saying if you have young, your, your, your sons, if they're 13 or older, uh, we're asking them to come on so they can... Um, Observe how the guys hang out and uh, the way that uh, we interact with one another. And so uh, bring your sons, uh, 13 or older, it would be uh, great to have them there. Uh, ladies got together last week. I heard that that went well. You all had a great time. So uh, glad that you all able to, to participate in that. And I think the last announcement then we want to make is for Sunday school. We've been talking about a slight change in our Sunday school schedule with all the uh, pandemic stuff going on. We're still not going to start our regular Sunday school that would go from 9 to 10 starting in September. Um, we just don't feel at this point it will be um, safe to put everybody into these smaller classrooms. So starting in September, first Sunday, I think that is the 6th of September, uh, we will have a modified Sunday school class here in the sanctuary for all ages. And uh, because it is all ages and we won't be having the normal activities that we do with kids, crafts and coloring and all that to kind of maybe let them sit through an hour, we're going to do a much shorter Sunday school. It'll be from 9.30 to 10. 9.30 to 10, starting September 6th, here in the sanctuary. And, uh, you know, we'll just keep an eye on things, as I'm sure you are. The session is doing the same thing uh, with the pandemic. And at some point, um, I'm sure we'll resume our regular schedule. But for now, that's what we've got. So did I miss any announcements for those of you who are in the know? Nope, looks like we got it all covered. All right, let's prepare then to worship our triune God.
People of God, we are gathered in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Our call to worship is from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Well, let's stand and do that very thing as we sing hymn number 34, The God of Abraham Praise. Great God, yes, the God of Abraham and our God, all might and majesty are indeed yours and indeed endless praise. O oh, Father in heaven, we gather this morning because you have called us here and how glad we are to be here this morning. We are responding to your call and we come gladly because the God of heaven the one who has made all things out of nothing, who created the heavens and the earth, has called us into his presence. 
And so, Father, we owe you an obligation for we are nothing but creatures. We are not whatever we may think. God's ourselves. And it's our privilege to come. But even more so, we come because not only are we your creatures, but we are your rebellious creatures, sinful creatures who have raised an angry fist against you. And you, how did you respond? With love and mercy and kindness and tenderness. And you have come to us, O oh God, broken, sinful as we are. And yet you still call us a people whom you have called, a people whom you have redeemed, a people whom you have justified, a people who you claim for your very own. So how can we not come with joy and gladness in our hearts as we stand before the God who created all things, the God who redeems us, the God who loves us above all else? Father, what a great privilege you have bestowed on us and we know it comes all through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather this morning, we've been promised that Jesus himself would be with us here. And so we pray, Father, as we gather to sing and to read your word and to hear that word preached to us, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, would inhabit our praises so that everything that we do and say and think during this time of worship would redound to the glory of Jesus Christ, that his name would be lifted up and magnified and that we would be reminded once again of the great privilege, the great position in which we stand as children of God through Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and Savior of our souls. And we pray all these things, Father, in His name, who makes it all possible. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. First Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 11, says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should, be put, to si you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Here the Apostle Peter reminds us that we are to live in a way that is distinct and different from the ways of the world, that we are to leave behind those worldly passions and live in a way that models and mimics that of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're free. We've been freed from our sin because of what Jesus has done, and yet we're not to live with that freedom for sin. And yet if we're honest with ourselves, we recognize that altogether too often we have done exactly that. We have used our freedom for sin. And we have lived in, in alliance and in compliance with the ways of the world rather than with the ways of Christ. But Jesus is a merciful and forgiving God who welcomes us and calls us even now to confess our sin that we might repent and be made right with him again. We invite you then now to read along with me and pray along with me as we use the corporate confession of sin that's printed in your bulletin. Let us together confess our sins, saying, I, a poor sinner, acknowledge before you, my God and Creator, that I have terribly and in many ways sinned against you, not only outwardly, but much more with inward blindness, unbelief, doubts, despondency, impatience, pride, covetousness, envy, hatred, malice, and other sinful affections, as you, my Lord and God, know well, and I cannot deeply enough deplore. But I repent of these things, and am sorry for them, and heartily ask you for mercy. For the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. 
And now, people of God, lift up your heads and arise and hear these comforting words from Psalm 86. There the psalmist says in verse 4, Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. This is our hope. If you are calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is through Jesus that God is a forgiving God, then we have an advantage that David himself could not have 3,000 years ago. We know who Jesus is. We know how it is that he's brought us, to, uh, brought us to God. So if you're looking to him and to him alone for your right standing with God, then I can declare to you on the authority of the word of God as a minister of his gospel, then indeed your sins are forgiven forevermore. Amen. Amen. Let's go once more before the Lord and ask his blessing upon our reading and the preaching of the word. Our Father in heaven, we have already confessed that we are glad to be here. We are glad to be here because we congregate as your people. We get to enjoy fellowship with like-minded individuals who have been corporately brought together as the body of Christ. And as we gather together as that body, we long to hear from the head of that body speak. We long to hear Jesus, the head of his church, teach us once again. We've gathered, Father, as people who want to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear him as he speaks to us out of his word. We pray, Lord, that you would allow the Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and our minds so that as that word is read and preached to us in just a moment, that it would reach down deeply, not only into our heads so that we understand what is being read, but deep into our hearts so that we would, would be moved to praise and adoration and to love you and to love one another as we ought. We recognize that these things are not native to our breast. They are not the things that we would do on our own. And so we humbly ask again for your intervention in our lives to make us faithful disciples and followers of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. People of God, our first reading today is rather short, from 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 28. When you look at this passage, this is about the hope of Christians. The hope of Christians is the resurrection, that God has beat death in Jesus Christ. Now think about what I just said. God has beaten death the greatest enemy that all of us have. And what I want you to particularly focus on is that that's happened, of course, through Jesus. And it's happened because Jesus is the king. Only a king can exercise this level of power to conquer all his enemies. And as we read this, we realize that Jesus has indeed conquered every enemy, including that last enemy of death. Let's hear Paul then speak. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, 
then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Well, thus far, the reading of God's word. May we now stand as we hymn, sing hymn 265, Come ye faithful, raise the strain. Be seated. You can turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Psalm 76 or look on in your bulletin. Psalm 76. This is the infallible Word of God. Please give it your full attention. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. His abode has been established in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the flashing arrows, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war, Selah. Glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains, full of prey. The stout-hearted were stripped of their spoil. They sank into sleep. All the men of war were unable to use their hands. At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both rider and horse lay stunned. But you, you are to be feared. Who can stand before you when once your anger is roused? From the heavens you uttered judgment. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to establish judgment to save all the humble of the earth. Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. Make your vows to the Lord your God and perform them. Let all around him bring gifts to him who is to be feared, who cuts off the spirit of princes, who is to be feared by the kings of the earth. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains the same. Who do you fear most? God or your fellow man? Do you worry more about what others around you think of you than what God thinks of you? Do you find yourself longing to please others rather than pleasing God? 
And do you sometimes find that this fear of man becomes a barrier in your life to the gospel? But our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It's not easy. Fear of man can give us a cushy life here and now. Fear of man can give us, uh, it can keep us alive. Fear of man can keep us happy with our family and our neighbors and our co-workers. But fear of man makes a Christian spineless. And fear of man hardly makes us worthy for kingdom service. But it is the fear of God that will put a rod down your back. It is the very gospel that that God gives us that gives us the guts to stand firm in this life when our enemies, when affliction and persecution come before us. This was on full display, September 1596. John Knox's successor, Andrew Melville, full of godly bravery and grit, stood before King James VI of Scotland, grabbing his royal sleeve. You don't do that. Grabs his royal sleeve and reminds him that he is but God's silly vassal. Children, Andrew Melville told King James VI that he was in diapers when King Jesus was reigning over not just Scotland, but the world. Andrew Melville was not done. He continued saying, there are two kingdoms in Scotland. There is King James, the head of the commonwealth, and there is Christ Jesus, the king of the church whose subject James the sixth is, and of whose kingdom he is not a king, nor a lord, nor a head, but a member. He said, we will yield to you your place and give you all due obedience. But again, I say, you are not the head of the church. You cannot give us that eternal life which we seek for e even in this world, and you cannot deprive us of it. Andrew Melville spoke with courage and fearlessness of man because he feared God. King James could have lifted his head from his body, and he would imprison him 10 years later. But God was to be praised because King Jesus, not King James, King Jesus reigns and he has won the victory for our bodies and our souls. There's nothing that man can do to take that away from us. And when the day comes for you, beloved, when the day comes for you to be bold, remember that man does not give you eternal life. Man cannot take it away. Fear the Lord. Because he has and he will overthrow your enemies. He is worthy of praise and glory because he has won the victory. Psalm 76 is a hymn of victory. And it reminds us particularly, especially as New Testament Christians, it reminds us to fear God and to glorify King Jesus. That's what the psalm points us to, to fear God, not man, and to glorify King Jesus. I believe that premise is laid out in the first two verses, and then the following verses give us many reasons that we ought to fear God and glorify King Jesus. So verses 1 and 2, they lay this out, that God is great in the church, God dwells in her, so he ought to be feared. Now for Judah and Israel... Under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God's condescending to dwell in the temple uh, was, right out, was on Mount Zion, right outside of Jerusalem. Uh, verse 2, though, says Salem, right? Jeru, Salem, um, a term for peace. Right? You think shalom. It's the, it's the same consonants in Hebrew. Salem, shalom. So that his abode has been established in peace. So the psalmist brings out that reconciliation between God and his people. Because Judah and Israel, the Old Testament church, they were not always at peace with us. God did not always dwell with them. Rather, there was a time, just like with us, that we were counted as God's enemies. We were alienated. We were hostile to God. But God has reconciled us. How? Colossians 1.20 He's brought peace. He has brought Salem, uh, has come because of the blood of the cross 
which was shed right outside of Jerusalem. Of course, that hadn't happened yet for our psalmist. And so in the Old Testament, we have all these beautiful pictures and imagery, and there's a lot of it in the psalm. The beautiful imagery of God dwelling with his people and of the salvation to come. And so verse 2, we read that his abode is established at Salem on Mount Zion, and it was there that he dwelt in the temple. And that was a picture of God's dwelling in you to come. A picture of God's dwelling in the church to come, that God would be with his people. And there's also the beautiful imagery of this animal sacrifices taking place on Mount Zion, which is beautiful imagery of Jesus' sacrifice to come, which brings peace between God and man. And because we are at peace, because we have been reconciled, God dwells in us. And because we have been reconciled with God, God fights for his people. To attack the church is to attack the Lord himself. Whether it's Judah, whether it's Israel, whether it's the New Testament church, whether it is you, brothers and sisters, who make up Christ Presbyterian church, for us to be an attack is an attack upon the Lord himself. And so brothers and sisters, as we look at these first two verses, that our Lord is glorious and to be praised, take courage, be brave, because your God has brought peace and reconciliation through Christ. He has not left you as orphans, but has sent his spirit to dwell in you. He will be faithful to us, even when not if, but when we are attacked by Satan and when we are attacked by the world. Those kingdoms will have no victories. Our Lord will put them to flight. And these following verses, 3 through 12, give us six reasons to believe that. To believe that God has conquered our enemies, and so we ought to praise, uh, fear him and praise him. Uh, but to fear him, and it's that conquering that we see King Jesus so the first reason we are to fear God and love King Jesus in verse 3 is that God will overthrow our enemies. This psalm was very likely written after the events of 2 Kings 19. Assyria was coming for Jerusalem. They're having skirmishes uh, around the city. And good King Hezekiah, who fears God and not man, does what? He prays. He prays for deliverance because, humanly speaking, Jerusalem should be demolished by the Assyrians. But one night, the angel of the Lord appears, striking down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers right outside of Salem's walls. Surely the Lord broke the flashing arrow, the shield, the sword, and the weapons of war. Because to attack God's people is to attack God himself. And how foolish it is to fight against the very God who in a second can take everything that's needed from you to fight him. That is your very life. No doubt the church was encouraged to see her enemies overthrown, leading to a fear of God, not a fear of man. And while God did defend Jerusalem physically, and it's a real historical event, the main point is God's continual care for the church as God defends her, which encourages us, encourages us to have no doubts, encourages us to have no hesitations and to glory in God's protection of his church. We glory when Satan attacks us with heresy because the Lord will overcome it. And we glory when our own sinful flesh is mortified because we are going to be made more like Christ. And we glory when we are being persecuted because it will come to an end. The weapons of war against us are the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers of darkness, spiritual forces of evil, and our God will overthrow them all. So God overthrows our enemies. He ought to be feared. In verse 4, uh, we ought to fear God over man because God is more glorious than any earthly king or kingdoms. Verse 4 says, glorious are you, more majestic than the mountains full of prey. 
Now in the ancient world, perhaps even today, there's nothing more glorious than for a king or a ruler to overtake more land, to go just from mountain to mountain conquering peoples, to take control. And the psalmist styles it here is that the people and their possessions are the prey of the mountains that the world longs to overtake. And there is violence and extortion. A king might come to the mountain and take your land, your house. He might take your wife, your children. Or maybe he'll let you stay there but make you pay an exorbitant price to do so. Violence and extortion. Now compare that with the kingdom of God. The world is full of cruelty. God is full of love. Earthly kingdoms are violent, but God brings peace. And because of this cruelty and violence and extortion, it might seem sensible to fear man rather than God when the army's knocking down on your door, on your mountain. But fear him who is the king of kings with an everlasting kingdom. Love King Jesus who gives his life rather than taking ours. Who gives his own life to conquer sin and to give us a new heart. Jesus doesn't view us as prey to be conquered, but he views us as those who need to be loved. And he doesn't take our lives. He gives his own. He doesn't take advantage of us as prey. Rather, he became disadvantaged, perhaps to put it lightly, but he became disadvantaged to die in our place. Surely we ought to fear God as he is more glorious than any earthly king or kingdom. Next, verses 5 and 6 show forth that God has no use for the enemy's weapons. God has no use for the enemy's weapons. Why fear God over man? Because his power is greater than anything people put their hope and confidence in. When the Assyrians were coming to overtake the prey on Mount Zion, they had confidence in their numbers, their weapons, their ability, their horses, but what happened? It meant nothing as God's power is greater. He overtook them. Couldn't even use their hands because God rebuked them. We read that they died. Verse 5, they slept. The power of mankind can be great and threatening. Right? Perhaps a boss tells you to sin or lose your job. It can seem like we might want to give in to the fear of man. But there is no political or military power, no authority that is greater than God's power. Our God has the decisive weapon in the battle. And all he has to do is speak, to breathe. And all the powers that come to overtake us are nothing. Putting our hope in created things can seem to satisfy us. Maybe it's the government, maybe it's ourselves, maybe it's some other sort of human leaders. But there's no reason to fear the created things over God. We fear the creator, not the creature. Psalm 146 says it well. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is is in the Lord, his God. That's where our hope must be. Not like the world that takes confidence, but without salvation, they all die. Rather, we are satisfied with the favor of God alone. We know he is all sufficient, and he overcomes the greatest threats to the church. So our Lord has no use of the enemy's weapons. He simply uses his breath. So he ought to be feared. And then verse 7, fourth reason to fear the Lord. It literally says, but you, you are to be feared. Who can stand before you once your anger is roused? So we fear the Lord because we know that none can stand before him. Not on their own merit. The repetition of you underscores there is no other. It is you, you, God alone to be feared because who 
who can stand before the Lord once his anger is roused? Uh, probably a lot of people in our culture don't like the idea of God being angry. It doesn't quite jive, they think. In fact, speaking of the wrath of God might seem odd to some of us. But we must remember there is a divine anger that is righteous. An anger that is good. And anger, anger only becomes wrong when we sin. God is angry at sin, but he does not sin in his anger. And when his righteous anger is roused against sin and sinners, none can stand. When his wrath is raised against sinners, none can stand. It ought to cause us to praise God that he has poured out that wrath on Jesus on the cross on our behalf. We do not need to be afraid of God and his wrath because Jesus took that punishment for us. But that wasn't for all people. There are still some that will face God in his anger. Consider the sixth seal. Revelation 6 puts this, uh, illustrates this very well. We read, Then the kings of the earth and the great ones, and the generals and the rich and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? That's the wrath of Jesus coming for those who do not believe. Friend, if you're here this morning not trusting in Christ alone for your salvation, the words of Psalm 76 verse 7 ring true. You cannot stand before God when his anger is roused against you. What can you possibly say before God on judgment day if you don't have Christ? This week I met a couple. She claimed to be a Christian. He, a Buddhist. Interestingly, they both had a very similar worldview. And they said, we can stand on that day. We can stand because we're good people. And we can stand because we help others. And I said, well, let me help you the best way I know how. You're a sinner who needs to repent and turn to God and trust in Christ alone for your salvation. All people are bad people, and we need the goodness of Jesus. Only then can we stand on the day of judgment. Revelation 6 reminds us that either we will be comforted by Christ because he took the wrath we deserve, or we will be crushed by Christ because of his wrath for sin poured out on us. <clears throat> Friend, if you're not believing today, I exhort you, fear God and love King Jesus. Turn to him. But it's difficult. As was just illustrated, many people don't want to turn to Jesus because they're not humble. Verses 8 and 9 show us that we ought to fear God because of his judgment and his salvation of the meek or the humble. So we find the meek, the humble, uh, meek in the King James um, but we also find that in the Beatitudes, right? Matthew 5, we're told, blessed are the meek. And meekness or humility, uh, that's not for super Christians. I think sometimes we can read the Beatitude and think those are for those really godly people, not for me. It's for all of us. Every one of us has the blessing of being meek. Christians are meek. Non-Christians are not meek. In other words, you cannot be a Christian and think you're wonderful, right? Like that couple. You cannot say, I'm a good person who helps people. I'm so wonderful. Rather, we humble ourselves. Perhaps you've seen the athletes and the billboards around town with the, the phrase, I am second, right? Hashtag, I am second, meaning we put God first. Excellent. But I am second, Oh no, brothers and sisters, we're not second, we're not third, we're not fourth, we're last, we are meek, we are humble, and God saves the humble. A Christian is one who has seen himself for who he truly is. He has seen himself in all of his sin and was horrified. 
A Christian is somebody who has seen themselves as God sees them in their sin and is appalled. He has seen who he was before God and knows that God is so great to save a wretched sinner like himself. Thus the Christian is meek. We are called to be amazed at the way God treats us, that he treats us so well, sending his son to live and die for us. It ought to be the cause of our meekness. It's a beautiful quality in the Christian. Sinclair Ferguson wrote that humility enhances manliness. It adorns femininity. And it is a jewel to be polished by grace. It's meekness that causes us to not be self-sufficient. It's the very blessing that we need to fear God over man. Especially when the day comes and we need to take a stand. We need a humble strength as our pride has been broken and we are completely reliant upon God. That's why these two verses, 8 and 9, are such a comfort to the Christian. Because it shows that God cares about the afflicted and the persecuted. It shows his fatherly love. That he is the one to be feared. Because when he just speaks, the earth is still. And the haters of the church are judged. But the meek and humble are saved. So we ought to fear God for his great judgment on our enemies. And love King Jesus because he has brought salvation to us. And then verses 10 through 12 give us one more reason to fear the Lord. That is because he turns the malice of his enemies to his praise. Our Lord turns the malice of his enemies to his praise. Certainly this is true in the sense that enemies rage against the church and he turns to praise as whatever they try fails because they cannot prevail against God. So yes, we praise God for that. But even more so, God turns the wrath of man into praise by using what appears to be evil for his own good. Like all things, God is in control and he can use man's wrath for his glory. In fact, this is the answer to what many consider the Achilles heel of Christianity. If God is all-powerful and all-good, why does he permit evil? And one answer is he permits evil for good. It's clearly seen in the story of Joseph in Genesis 37 to 50. His brothers became jealous, threw him in a pit, sold him to some Ishmaelites. But we know he eventually ends up second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt, storing up grain because a famine is coming. And he feeds the land. And his brothers, the ones who were wrathful against him and did him evil, and they come at the end of the book and ask for forgiveness in a deceitful way, but they ask for forgiveness. And Joseph's response is, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Why does God permit evil? Because it saves lives, like in the life of Joseph. The greatest example, though, of evil being permitted for good is when we see man's wrath turn to God's praise in the story of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Jesus was the only perfectly good human, and yet men hated him so much that they wanted him dead. But the Lord uses the malice of his enemies to his praise, just as he used the crucifixion of Christ to save many lives. It was Jesus' shed blood, his death on the cross for his people that washes them clean. Why did God permit the greatest evil act in history? Because evil is permitted for good because it saves lives like yours and mine. So surely the wrath of man will praise God and that should cause us to fear and for us to praise this great God. But do we fear God or do we fear man? Are we going to continue to be more concerned about what others think of us or what God thinks of us? And is that a barrier to the gospel in our lives? 
If we have relationships with others in which we must act as a non-Christian because of the fear of man, we're in trouble. When we fear man more than we fear God, we sin and we are not at peace with God. Thankfully, God sent the Prince of Peace to bring about that Salem for us, to bring about peace for us. If you have been fearing man more than fearing God, look to the prince who satisfies God's wrath, who lived a perfect life because you couldn't, who shed his blood because your blood could not atone for sin, who died and resurrected on your behalf so that you would not remain dead and at enmity with God. Through these works, Jesus Christ brings peace. And as the great king, he conquers his enemies and ours, sin and death. No other man can do that. No other man can give you eternal life. So let us dwell on this psalm, Psalm 76, a victory psalm, and fear God. Praise King Jesus who brings us peace. And may that give us the courage and the fearlessness to stand when the day comes with boldness to testify about God's greatness, just as Andrew Melville did so many years ago. And when the day comes for you, beloved, to be bold, again, remember, man does not give you that eternal life and they cannot take it away. Fear the Lord because he has and he will overthrow your enemies. He is worthy of praise and glory because he has already won the victory. Fear God. Glorify King Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. In you, O oh God, do we put our trust and let us never be ashamed. Our souls wait upon you for from you comes our salvation. You are our only rock in our salvation. And you is our glory and our strength and our refuge. And from you is our expectation. When our earthly fear of man refuges fail us, and when no one cares for our souls, we cry to you, O Lord, because you are our perfect refuge and our portion in this land. We've seen some trust in chariots and some in horses, some in money and worldly power. But we will remember your name. We will trust in your mercy forever and ever. We have hoped in your word. So Lord, remember your word to your servants here, upon which you have caused us to hope. And when it is your will, O Lord, to have us stand, give us the spirit of truth and give us the spirit of power to stand strong. Let us not fear man, but you alone. May we praise King Jesus, because he has brought peace to us by conquering his and our enemies. We pray this not just for our church, but churches um, in our own presbytery, particularly Tyler OPC in Tyler, Texas. We ask, Lord, that you would preserve this church as a lampstand for coming generations, that the children there would grow up loving your gospel and their children and their children's children. May this congregation be full of generations that are a testament to your covenantal faithfulness. And for her pastor, John Johnson, we pray for boldness in making known the mystery of your gospel, that he may speak as he ought to speak as an able minister of the New Testament. And may he speak in the spirit and obtain your mercy as he ministers to the faithful. We also remember our home missionary, Ken Golden, in Davenport, Iowa. May the gospel be preached in Davenport to all people in order that they might believe. Let the people who sit in darkness see a great light. Add to your church daily those that are being saved. Bring your seed from the east and the west. May they not hold back, but that men, women, and children would all be brought forth to glorify and honor your name. Let Reverend Golden and the church be known as great among the people so that knowledge of you may be known in Iowa. 
and for our happenings in Uganda. Lord, we ask that you would work mightily in Reverend Tuninga's life to showcase the gospel to others. That you would uphold his wife, Diana, and their nine children by your might. And we pray for our missionaries, that they would flourish in Mbale and in the Karamajong. Keep the Jacksons strong and focused on their kingdom work. And the several Ugandans who have been trained in our preaching, may they resolve to preach Christ crucified and nothing else. For those of us here at Christ Church OPC, we pray for Alma Miller. We give thanks that she is getting better and better in her mental and in her physical state. We are grateful that you hear our prayers and answer them with her healing. What a loving father you are caring for your children. We also pray for our brother, Brandon Luter, to have the fortitude as he continues to get physically fit uh, for his heart transplant. We give thanks that you have upheld him and that he and April would continue to depend on you for all things. Increase their faith and trust in you. Let them remember the great physician who can not only heal our physical hearts, but has given us new hearts to love him. And for all of us here, we ask that you would make us to partake of that inheritance of the saints, that we would find our comfort in our Savior, who one day will change our vile bodies and fashion them like his into a glorified body. And may we set our affections on things above so that our lives would be hid with Christ, that when he appears in glory, we will be there and see him as he is. And while we look forward to that great heavenly Jerusalem that you have made, help us to comfort ourselves and one another with the words of wisdom, seeking purity in thought, word and deed. Our God, we lift up your holy name for you have loved us and you have given us an everlasting consolation and hope through grace. We ask now to comfort our hearts and establish us in every good work. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
please remain standing as we confess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed found on page 845 of the hymnal. Page 845, we'll confess together the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come now to the visible gospel uh, of Jesus Christ, that his body was broken and his blood was shed for his people uh, to make us more and more like him. And perhaps now you're thinking, I don't fear God the way I ought. Lord, forgive me. Or you think, I need to glorify King Jesus and not be king of my own life. And if that is you this morning, we certainly invite you to come and partake knowing that the Holy Spirit uses this sacrament to make us more like Christ, to make us fear God more, to make Jesus truly king of all things as we recognize him as such. So yes, this supper is for those who are members and uh, um, communicant members in good standing of a church. It's for those who are repenting of their sins. It's for those who have been baptized. Uh, and it's for those who are weak and in need of the grace of God. However, if you're sitting there saying, I don't really care, I'll keep fearing man, or I really don't want Jesus to be uh, the king, I kind of like ruling my own world, we ask that you let these elements pass by. Uh, if you're not a member in good standing uh, of, of a church, we ask that you let them pass by. Uh, and use this time to think uh, about your standing before the great God. Because who can stand and face God's wrath on that day of judgment? But praise God, he has given us this supper where we see bread broken as Christ's body was broken, as that wrath was poured out and as his blood was shed for our salvation. So, well, let us pray uh, prior to partaking. Lord, we uh, bless your holy name that you provide all the means of grace to grow us, to make us more like our Savior, to grant us those godly desires of our heart to be like him. And we thank you that you use your spirit uh, to come and to do so through the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And that while the bread remains bread, you do use it to remind us that we need spiritual nourishment in our life. As the wine remains wine, you use it to our comfort to know that Christ's blood was shed and we truly are forgiven. So we ask now that you would bless these elements for your holy sacrament. And we pray this. Um, as Christ taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, 
as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, and broke it. As we, ministering in his name, uh, give this bread to you. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, our Lord took the cup. And speak as your sensible people. Judge for yourself what I say. The cup of blessing that we bless is not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break is not a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we partake of the one bread. Consider the people of Israel. Are not those who eat the sac sacrifices participants in the altar? What do I imply then? that food offered to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything. No, I imply that what pagan sacrifice they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. 
You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Shall we provoke the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? said this cup is a new covenant of my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins all of you drink of it you are the creator and that all things that are created are yours uh, to do with as you please. We are grateful that you have seen fit to give us such good gifts. So we do come before you as the meek, humbly uh, accepting what you give us, but also returning a portion, recognizing that it came from you and that it's truly yours and ought to be used uh, not for our own advancement, but for the kingdom advancement. And so we ask that these offerings would be used for such. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. of Christ, receive the benediction of your Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.